plants. They purify air, filter water, provide food and shelter. Plants brighten up our spaces and our moods as well. Most importantly, plants do the absolutely necessary job of regulating the environment, which make them indispensable to life. As an urban farmer, I'm obsessed with food. From running a cafe, cooking in fine dining restaurants, to learning how to farm in Australia, I've spent more than a decade tracing the journey of food from farm to table. And what I've discovered is that the secret to good food is all about the source, where it comes from, how it's grown. It all evolves down to nature. If nature holds the key to flavor, I wonder what other lessons might there be, waiting to be uncovered out there in the wild. studying in Australia. I was surfing almost every day, so that helped me form a strong connection with nature. So when I came back, I was looking for something similar, and of course there are no waves here, so that was a bit disappointing. But I found something that was close enough to it. So often I just paddle out and I sit in the middle of the sea and I just do nothing. I just appreciate the quietness and tranquility of nature. Sometimes I'm a bit adventurous and if I feel like a seafood, <laughs> I go. Uh, forage for some seafood, like mussels. As a farmer, food is, is definitely the way I connect with nature. I'm always very curious to find out how everything is grown. And the more I delve into it, the more I realise there is a way of coexisting with nature and producing food in a way that is very, very responsible. I'm currently writing a book about my journey in food, searching for that meaning of food. Hi Chris, hey, hi, come Sherry. on in, come on hey. in. You know, Chris, when I look at this chapter on Earth Keepers, I was very struck by the first sentence. I was in deep shit. What do you mean by that? I know it sounds funny, but actually I do have a, a photo. Oh, okay. <laughs> at the farm, right, the first task was to work with manure, actually. Oh, yeah, okay. so I was using the manure to fertilize the plants and mm. prepare the soil. Okay. Yeah, so okay. I, I, I really wanted to be a bit more provocative and yes stir up the reader's interest. That's why I decided yes, to use the word. Yes. The interesting thing is, it didn't smell bad at all. It actually smelled like grass or hay. Mm. Okay. So okay. It, it really changed my impression of <laughs> dealing with waste. Oh, okay. Earth Keepers is a self-sufficient farm in a small suburb in New South Wales. The owners Paul and Judith seeded my dreams of becoming a farmer. Now it's time for me to pass it on. That's exactly why I wanted to write this book mm. um, to inspire uh, a new generation of urban farmers. So in a way, I'm hoping to plant the seed in people's hearts and minds. Yeah, in the yeah, next generation, yeah, yeah. growing food and then eating it. You know, just being able to pluck a tomato that they grew and eating that it was just such a very direct and real connection. Maybe this is a better way to live, and this is what we should be doing, right? Being close to your food source is, is a lifestyle, it's, it's a way of living that uh, resonated very strongly with me. My goal is to encourage more people to grow their own food. And I believe chefs can drive this change. A Hawkerton restauranteur, Chef Jason is passionate about using fresh local vegetables in his dishes. I tend to go out to interact with my customer, right? To tell them, hey, today I use this uh, local produce. Today I use this local maipo to really enhance the flavor. Hey, tell me how does it taste? I just want people to go out thinking that and knowing that they learn something. Have you ever thought of growing stuff within the restaurant now? Yes, I always wanted to bring because that's why we got plants here and there. But the only concern is I scared people steal my plants and all. But if I'm able to grow indoor, right? Yeah. Why not? Right, they can taste the freshness from the table thing. It's like the most awesome thing that can come out from a restaurant. So I'm going to make your dream come true by setting up an edible garden right here in your restaurant for you. Okay, make yourself at home. If you can do it, I will gladly use it. To 
find inspiration for Chef Jason's garden, I'm turning to nature. Edible plants are all around us. We only need to look at the right places. When I started uh, learning about plants, everything just looks like a sea of green. But I start to look at each of these plants individually. To me, the most interesting ones are, of course, those that are edible, those that I can eat. Over here, uh, you can see, start to see some fruits on the ground. So uh, what we have here is actually uh, one of our native uh, species of uh, nutmeg. Whoa. So this is actually the fruit. So it's named after Sir William Farquhar. So if you take a look at it, yeah, it resembles a nutmeg, but a much smaller nutmeg. Is that a smell? A slight spicy smell? Yeah, very, very, very thin. Very thin, spicy yeah. smell. Yeah, yeah, a bit sweet also. <laughs> yeah. It's a bit like perfume, yeah. like very nice perfume. <laughs> I can imagine being in a spa and <laughs> smelling this. So walking to the forest is like walking to the candy shop. At every few steps, you know, we, we found introduce a different kind of edible plant to me. And some of them were not just for human consumption, but some were actually for birds or for monkeys. You want to uh, make a guess what this fruit is? I don't know, man. It looks a little bit like a cross between a rambutan and, <laughs> and a cake fruit. So it's not a rambutan, uh, neither is it a durian. Uh, so this is actually uh, one of our forest uh, jackfruits. Mm. So uh, like the common jackfruit that we eat or the chumpada, uh, these are all Atocarpus species. Uh, but this particular species uh, is commonly known as the monkey jack. So this is actually the, the fruit uh, mm. with the seed. But unlike the chumba duck or the jackfruit, which normally is quite big and you get lots of seeds, this one uh, you maybe get about like, there's one here, two, about four of them. Yeah, we're actually very lucky. Oh. <laughs> Can I smell? Like, yeah, do they sure. have any aroma? Uh, a faint aroma. So, oh. Um, actually, nice. yeah, yeah. if you go to uh, some of the neighbouring countries uh, like in Borneo or in mm. Peninsular Malaysia, in the villages, uh, they do eat uh, this mm. as a fruit. Okay. So, yeah. As we moved even deeper in the forest, the other beautiful thing that I saw was how unique some of the shapes and sizes of these plants and flowers were. For example, the ginger plant that he introduced to us. At first, I thought the red flowers on the ground were some form of fungi or mushroom, but actually those were the flowers of the plant. The interesting thing about this ginger is that it's found nowhere else in the world except here in Singapore. So it's uniquely Singapore. Do you know what, what is their purpose in the wild? Is there a strategy for them? Ah, okay. So for gingers, they are not as tall as the trees. They can't mm. grow up to about 30, 40 meters tall. So they actually occupy uh, the forest floor niche. They grow in shade. Uh, and they do produce uh, flowers like the ones that you see here, uh, which are actually pollinated by sometimes uh, nectivorous birds. So uh, for the gingers, they provide uh, food and also nectar to uh, the forest uh, animal and also insects as well. Going into the forest, I observed there's all these different parts of an ecosystem that exist um, and everything is interdependent on one another. And I guess when I look at growing edible plants, I also start to, to realise that we can't grow things in just isolation. We have to think about it in a, in a bigger, in a more macro perspective and how we can include different elements to help support one another. So uh, if you look further up, <laughs> uh, the young leaves are reddish in colour. By observing some of these plants that actually grow in the forest, I think we can then learn roughly how do these plants actually grow in the wild, what would be the optimum conditions for them to grow in. Uh, and these actually can be brought back uh, home uh, as we live in our urban setting, you know, like at home. Of course, we don't have a forest uh, like here, but uh, we can try to uh, replicate or mimic certain environmental growing conditions that are suitable for growing some of these plants at home. Nature has the ideal conditions for edibles to thrive. At work, I replicate those conditions using technology. But natural farming is where my heart lies. 
So natural farming is, is really a collection of different sort of systems that work within a much larger system. So for example, uh, water, it actually works in a cycle. So as it rains, it goes into the soil, the plants take it up, and it goes back as rain. So natural farming um, allows the farmer to create this system and he doesn't have to water the plants because everything is taken care of uh, naturally. To apply the knowledge I have in natural farming, I'm starting a gardening project with some of my neighbours here at this rooftop garden. Today the plan is we will settle the beds, these two beds, yeah. then we will put compost because the compost is ready already. Then we'll plant in the new seeds. You all brought some seeds or seedlings? I have, uh, I have kailan, uh, Okay, yeah, then we can plant in the herbs and seedlings. Then we cover up with um, a leaf mulch. Oh, okay not? Oh, okay. Right now, the garden is in a very, very raw state. We are trying to improve the condition of the soil by adding more organic material like food waste or dried leaves. We are really at the early stages of how building this space. Yeah. And it's perfect because it's going to rain now, so... Wow! Yeah. This kailan is from your home, is it? Yeah. Is this a wing bean? Yeah. So we'll, we'll put it beside yeah, the yeah, pond. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, so the idea is that it will, it will grow beside the pond. This process is called mulching. It's like creating an armour for the soil below. So when the rain comes right, it prevents the impact onto the soil. And then it also prevents the water from evaporating too fast. If you know how to work with nature, like using this dried leaves, then actually you don't need to water so much. So it's really recreating the setup to be like a natural rainforest. Yeah, then the farmer doesn't need to do anything. He can just sit back and relax and watch the plants grow. Yeah. Good idea. In 2014, I came back from Australia determined to pursue my farming ambitions. Thirsty for opportunities to put my knowledge in natural farming to good use. But reality soon set in. I think natural farming is challenging because of um, the current infrastructure that Singapore has. So there's a lot of built-up areas and therefore a lack of land space to allow you to have soil and grow plants that may be quite large. Evelyn. Hi. Good to see you ah, again. Come. Yeah, good to see you. When I just needed help also. Okay. Okay. Come, let me help you. Yeah. So you want to clear this? Yeah, until, clear until all I... this. Yeah. So maybe you want to start here. Okay. So that you don't bang into each other. <laughs> this is Green Circle Eco Farm, where Evelyn practices natural farming methods on this 2.2 hectare size land. It's been around since 1999, but not many know of its existence. Our place is so deep in, in, in the Kranji area, it's really like finding a treasure. This may be a farm, but don't expect to see rows of neatly lined crops. The greenery is so dense, you'd think you are in a forest. And you would be right, this is a food forest. So a, a food forest, it's a sort of environment where a farmer tries to recreate a natural setting in a forest. So you have different layers. For example, you have larger trees that provide shade to uh, the plants below. Uh, it also provides support for maybe climbing plants. And you have different layers like the ground cover that keeps the soil cool. And you also have plants in the middle like shrubs that you know do its own thing. So really a food forest is a way of designing a farm to mimic a natural forest. So a food forest uh, is actually seven layers. Can you can see it here. Oh yeah. Yeah. So I would call this the emergent layer, uh, yeah. the first layer. First top layer. Yeah, first layer. So mango second layer. Then this can be the third layer. Mm. Then this is actually like the fourth layer, mm. the shrub layer. Uh. Yeah. Yeah. 
Okay, and then the ground cover layer yeah. is a fifth layer, you okay. know, food forest and in any forest, actually the bird life is also quite important. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and they are quite a good uh, uh, dispersal, you know, for seeds actually. So sometimes I tell people that ah, I didn't plant this papaya tree, the birds planted it for me. And then sometimes uh, when you have a tree, uh, there's a dead branch, uh, you, you let it be so that the bird can perch uh, and then they can look for insects. Uh, mm. like, yeah. So living or, or dead, everything has a, a place in this garden? Yeah, uh, everything. That's so, that's so nice. yeah. Yeah. All life is important here. Weeds, let them grow. Pests, leave them be. The farm follows a strictly no chemicals, no tilling and no weeding policy. And in the forest, the soil yeah, is so rich in, in our microbial life. You know. When we eat all these uh, vegetables that is grown in the food forest, uh, you will be consuming the, the microbes as well. But these are the good microbes. A good soil will contain good microbes that is suitable for you. The way to build a microbial life is actually not to disturb the soil at all. So, after a while, I graduated to no tilling at all. So that the living organisms in the soil, you know, are hardly disturbed. Oh. Yeah, because it's very delicious raw. Oh. The lesson here is, work with nature. That means, if nature doesn't give you the vegetables you like today, eat something else. So, uh, Evelyn, which is the most popular vegetable? I'm afraid the most popular ones are the Chinese vegetables, the Chai Sim Pai Chai Chinese cabbage, you know. Ah. But it's not really suited for our climate. Eh? So, when we plant the seeds, eh, the seedlings eh, were so poor and weak that when we transplant, eh, they don't do well and eh? progressively they die. That's why now, you know, I don't have these uh, Chinese vegetables at all. A wiser way to eat is to eat according to what's available. And despite Singapore's hot weather, we have plenty to offer. Native greens like Azistasia, Bayam, Ulam Raja. These are plants that grow as part of Singapore's natural vegetation. So they thrive easily all year round in our climate. So you know, Ulam is a way of eating raw by the Malays. Eh? Yes. So you can have Ulam hibiscus, Ulam laksa leaf, Ulam mint, Ulam Mexican tarragon, and this one, Raja, Ulam Raja. Oh. So that means it's the king of the Ulam vegetables. Mm. Oh, that's one of my favourite uh, plants to eat with uh, amalet. Yeah, Moringa, superfood. Superfood, <laughs> yeah, it's uh, apparently very high in some of the vitamins. Oh, so many biochemicals in it, I can't remember. Vitamin C, uh, iron. It's a superfood, you know? Yeah. Yeah. In fact, from this, it looks like the whole pharmacy is inside it here. It is, it is. <laughs> wow, look at all the colours. So yeah. beautiful. You've got the superfood, Moringa. So I think the idea for the nasi ulam is we really want to mix up like a salad. All the, all the different tastes. The highlight of today's lunch for me is a dish called nasi ulam, which is a rice herb salad. The process of creating this dish is you have rice that is mixed with shredded coconut and you essentially mix all the different herbs that is fresh. You got all the different flavours, right? The sweet, sour, a bit bitter. Mm. And it's actually very wholesome uh, because uh, you've got plenty of protein, carbohydrates. So this is a very good a vegetarian dish, a wholesome vegetarian dish. What I feel strongly about this dish is that it really represents Evelyn and her personality of working with nature. Everything is fresh, everything is seasonal. You know, it, this dish will change every single day depending on what is available. So, you know, it teaches us to use what we have, you know, and what is best at that moment in time. In my ideal world, every farm would be a food forest where there will be no chemical fertilizers and pesticides used in the quest to produce delicious and bountiful food. 
but in reality, the agriculture industry is heavily dependent on chemicals. Farmers in general, because they have so much at stake, they often use chemicals not because they want to, but because there's no other way to produce food fast. My work allows me to take a small step towards a chemical-free agriculture utopia. So what we try to do is, we go direct to the farmers who are doing the right thing, as much as we can, farmers who don't use chemicals, and then we try to reduce the risk by doing contract farming. So we, we would say, okay, like, let's grow these amount of crops for us, and if you have a bountiful harvest, we will take whatever excess that you have. Actually, the, the shipment that came in, I cut up some of the stuff. The Shaventai's melon, it's very, very aromatic, and it's, it's very sweet as well. So I think our customers are really going to like it. And if weather changes or you have a pest infestation, and production drops, it's okay. We won't penalize you for that. Uh, I think that will keep things fresh and exciting. Okay. Yeah, everything's amazing. So yeah, really thank you so much for, for the hard work. To grow food in Singapore, we can't avoid technology. Grow lights and hydroponic systems are innovative ways to circumvent our land and resource constraints. But have we left nature behind in our pursuit of yield? What part does nature play as we turn to technology for answers? and then you can actually look at your control systems from anywhere in the world. Hmm. I think if we just look back at the history of civilization and farming, People always were in groups, you know, they hunted together, they fished together, and then they shared food together. So it is a very, very uh, natural part of who we are and what we do. And now that we have completely detached the food system, and you know, people who grow food just do their own thing, and people who eat food do their own thing, and there's this is a big gap that, that is missing, and there is no bridge for both sides to understand um, what each other is doing. Come, come, I'll show you some things that we are dealing with and developing. Uh, We've got a lot of uh, techie stuff here. Uh, in Singapore, technology makes growing food possible. Something that was once thought to be difficult with less than ideal climate and land conditions. This is a vertically stacked one, so it's basically vertical growing. Yeah. This is actually a hybrid one, it's not necessarily all completely indoors. So I've created this place with shade nets and cooling down the area, but uh, also to allow uh, ventilation to go across as well. Known as Singapore's plant whisperer, Vira spent decades greening the country. Some of his horticulture projects include the zoo, night safari, and Changi Airport. In 2008, he set up Greenology with a simple mission, to bring greenery to urbanites. There's a chiller below uh, that allows the nutrient solution to be chilled uh, because the temperature differential in, in this environment right, can also trigger different root uh, growth rates within the plants as well. By controlling airflow, regulating temperature, and supplementing nutrients, high-tech systems like this create a controlled environment for temperate plants to thrive all year round in our tropical climate. So you realise typically you'll have the, the, the red and the blue, and a little bit of the white as well, which is a little bit more high blue. So then there's a few variations of this. And this has got a bit of red, which I can vary as well. In the wild, plants are exposed to the full spectrum of light. Indoor plants, however, may be lacking a certain part of the colour spectrum that outdoor plants naturally receive. Blue light helps with photosynthesis, whereas red encourages plants to flower and produce fruit. I see some fancy gadgets here. Hey, yes, these sensors are all here. They give me a lot of readings. It's a smart agriculture system that gives me the, the environmental uh, readings as well as also the soil condition readings as well. So I got different moisture sensors plus also ECPH sensors all plugged in. This goes on to a network, cloud network, and then you can actually look at your control systems from anywhere in the world. So using all this data allows us to be smart farmers as well. While technology is a huge part of what he does, there is a lot more to him than meets the eye. I think the fundamentals of growing plants, whether gardening or even edibles, right? needs to start with also having this association and understanding how plants grow. And this is reality, right? The, the soil is here, the planters are here, uh, how the vegetables grow here is what you need to learn before you go on to the high-tech stuff. 
So the high tech stuff, a lot of people are taking shortcuts. They're just bypassing all this and they all just want to be urban farmers and just go straight in. Uh, but the science starts with this, the fundamentals. I think it's important to understand how pl the plant science and how plants grow in a natural environment before you go into a controlled environment as well. Prior to coming to greenology, I guess I've been always quite sceptical of over-reliance on technology in, in farming. Uh, but stepping into Viva's space really made me realise that technology is just a tool and an enabler for the gardener to make better decisions. And there is a spectrum. You don't have to be all sterile and cold. You can have a little bit of wilderness in there uh, and balance and moderate this coldness of technology. But driving that passion of bringing greenery to urban spaces is nature that's stripped of all the gadgets and automation, and even his footwear. Hey Chris, after hey. all this experience that we have had, I've taken off my shoes, right? It's about time you have that feel as well. Okay. Take off your shoes and I'll bring you down to that stream bed. Yeah. How does it feel? Quite shook, right? Yeah, really nice. Yeah. yeah. So this, this is quite good. The feel underfoot, right, is quite nice. As long as you don't step on thorns, you're fine. <laughs> right? But soil, right, is very, very therapeutic as well to get on your feet. When my feet touched the ground, uh, the sensation was very raw and my, my whole body felt very much alive. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think we should get more children in schools to take off their shoes and walk barefoot in the school fields. So I'm, it's very sad when all the school fields become artificial turfs as well. So how do you then entice them to go into parks to actually then appreciate all these different little, little nuggets of nature that we have that actually gives you so much motivation to understand yourself and understand nature as well. So everything that you see, right, you're just completely attuned and completely attuned with nature, you find that you will learn so much more from nature than anything else. Because our environment is very sterile, Singaporeans have lost a connection to nature. What happens over time is we, we become afraid of nature. And, and I do think that that is a, a skill that we need to regain this sensing and awareness of the natural environment because uh, it is just better for us, you know, mentally, holistically. It, it just makes us happier. Both Evelyn and Vera have given me some food for thought as I think about how to grow edibles in Chef Jason's restaurant. But first, I want to figure out what we might be growing. Yeah, so we have a mix of different herbs, uh, vegetables and even edible flowers. Very pretty flower. This is called Tonkin Jasmine. Donkey Jasmine? Uh, Tonkin Jasmine. Oh. Flavour, a, like, a bit like ginger. Very herby, but very sweet. Yeah. But the sweet really hits you very... Subtle. Yeah, this this one I really really like. Don't don't take too much. It's quite intense. <laughs> I'm not scared. <laughs> I'm, I'm excited wow. to see your reaction. <laughs> wow, the bitterness tastes very long. It's very very in your face. This is called go to cola. Actually, a lot of the bitter plants have a lot of medicinal value. So the more bitter it is, the, the better it is for your body. Many of these plants and herbs, which initially have a very intense or strong flavor, which could put people off later transform into something much more mellow and pleasant with very simple cooking techniques. This, when I eaten just now, right, I feel like you make a crispy pork slice because they really got the earthiness. So make a pasta out of this. But this, right, maybe we'll do the traditional way. We can wrap it with like nuts and all. We'll try it by raw. When I gave Jason the vegetables and herbs to try, and I saw that spark of excitement in his eyes, and he could see how all these different flavours could complement the dishes. This one is not bacon, it's just pure... Pure pork belly. 
Okay, I think it's almost done. Yeah. Don't need to make it too crispy. So Jason created three dishes. The first dish was a pasta dish. I would call it a forest pasta because that's what it reminded me of, where we have the, the pork as well as the mushroom-flavoured vegetables. I would say that dish was a very, very nice harmony between the vegetables and, and, the, and the protein. Try everything together. Also, the texture is actually quite nice. Uh. It's very tender. It feels like it's like complementing each other flavours. Like the pork, the leaf, the pasta, the cheese and everything. It, it balances out so well. It's like an East Meat West dish. Then for this, right, like we say, we're going to preserve the flavours of it. So we're just going to eat it like a traditional salad. Mm. So we just assemble like Chinese popping, assemble here and there, dipping, then eat it. Okay. The second dish that we made, it was the wild pepper leaf that we wrapped with some crunchy ingredients like almonds and granola. And we dipped that into a fish sauce. Oh, the bitterness is gone. You don't taste bitter at all. The fish sauce really complements each other. The bitterness, everything is gone. You don't taste bitter at all. You don't even know that it's a bitter leaf if you don't taste it by itself. And the second dish was really delightful. Even though there was so much green, when I ate it, all that intensity disappeared. And I almost felt like I was just eating a, a, a snack. You know, a very healthy snack. For this, right, the salmon ceviche we already have ready. So we, yeah, it's on our menu. So we're going to use this to really complement the natural flavours from all the herbs. Up. The third dish was salmon ceviche in a passion fruit and orange uh, sauce. We added some herbs like ulam raja, butterfly pea and cranberry hibiscus. It smells good. The flavours were really like an explosion in your mouth. You had all these different fruitiness and citrusy. Very, very exciting on the, on the palate. The mango, yeah. now the mango really... Smell, like, smelling a sweet mango is for eating a fish. It's very nice. All three really complement each other. It's not, nobody is stealing, nobody is lamb like or anything. All these simple little greens, right, and flowers, right, these little, little colours, right, really glue each other together. Yeah. Yeah, it's quite an amazing thing. When we tried everything, I think that was really a moment of realisation of how good all these vegetables taste like. And I could imagine him wanting to continue working with them. <laughs> Have any suggested areas in this restaurant you think might be suitable? Uh, actually, I got one area which is where we used to plant stuff, but the plants are all dead now because I think lack of sunlight or not well taken care of here and there. This one, as you can see. This is actually a very good spot because on one end, it's quite close to the window. So if there's something nice and like a feature, it can actually attract customers who walk past to know more about this space. Plants. Need understanding. We need to understand the kind of environments they like, the kind of resources that they need. So the the rack here, I think, what will be interesting. We can grow different kind of plants, different flowers and herbs. Because Jason doesn't have enough sunlight to grow uh, the edible plants, so we're going to get grow lights uh, to act as the sunlight that he doesn't have. For Chef Jason's garden, I'm hoping to try something different. A system that utilizes both technology and nature. What have you got so far from your discussion with him? Yeah, so I think like firstly, his personality is quite quite colourful and quite okay. in interesting. Yeah. I think even for the plants that we are growing, mm. it's going to be like a diversity of herbs. Okay. Yeah, and you know, so we're going to be green and red and uh, diff yeah, different. And there's stuff a wild element that's going on there. As yeah, well, a little right? bit. Yeah. A little bit wild. Yeah. So I guess what I'm hearing from you is that there's you want some colour yeah. on top of that wildness that's happening. So from people walking past, it catches yeah. their eye. Correct. Yeah. Because we, we did some tasting and we found four yeah. plants that he really, really likes. Yeah, the first one is called Azistasia. Then we have the Ulam Raja. Ah. Uh, Ulam Raja tastes like green mango. Love it. Uh, it it yeah. does grow quite tall. It's about a metre tall. In many of the past gardens I've set up, especially those that are indoors, the plants that I've grown are mostly imported plants. Things like sunflower shoots, broccoli sprouts, or edible flowers like marigolds. So I've I've hardly had a chance to use local natives. So I think that's one of the biggest differentiators, uh, which is a, a more local crop selection. Hey, Hansing. Hey, Chris. Hey, how are you? Welcome. 
welcome to my little food forest. Wow, <laughs> I love the, the look of it. A tiny space, but we try to pack a lot of mm. food in here. These native vegetables may be unfamiliar to many Singaporeans, but one young home grower is trying to revive them. Chris, do you know what this is? Uh, no idea. It does look like, a bit like a chilli plant. Chilli plant? I have plant? no idea. No. This is called the... You try it first. Try it first. Try it first. I'm scared. It's called the king of bitter. It's the most bitter plant oh. <laughs> So this is actually a medicinal plant. Um, the Chinese tend to use it a lot when they have a sore throat. Mm -hmm. And then they'll pop it in the mouth. Liang yao ku you know? Yeah, it's really bitter. You can throw the rest oh. <laughs> into the ground. This, I'm sure you're familiar with. Yeah, I had, I had this. As a stasia. Yeah, it has a mushroomy taste, right? Like umami taste that I really, really like. Um, I use this a lot in my cooking. Mm. Yeah, so over here, I try to grow like a whole bunch of different like local native vet edibles. Lah. Yeah. Because, you know, if I choose to grow kale or like lettuce in here, the weather just won't do it in Singapore. Mm. It takes a lot more care and effort to take care of them. Whereas if I grow things like that, I basically can leave it alone for a week, two, even a month, and it'll still thrive on its own. This, do you know what this is? Uh, it looks like some form of uh, amaranth. Yeah, this is called wild bayam. Mm. So also known as Chinese spinach, this tastes earlier compared to the baby spinach we are more familiar with. With the ability to withstand some neglect, it's an easy plant to grow that is ready for harvest in as little as around 25 days. This is what the kampong people used to eat. And this is a, lo this is a real local native edible that people tend to forget about. Using this garden in her grandma's house, Han Sing is bringing back vegetables of bygone times. And in the process, she's reigniting some hope and joy into grandma's life. Oh, okay. My grandma is a huge part of my life. So this is actually her garden. Uh, when I was young, I remember I was here and that was the first time that I saw like the first caterpillar in my entire life. Okay. So around five years ago, uh, my grandma stopped working. Uh, she went for a couple of surgeries and that's where I felt like her, her morale sort of deep as well. Yeah, so what I wanted to redo this garden as like a little gift for her so that it can, you know, spur her on to do things. And I think it really helped because when she saw things growing, I felt like, you know, she's in and out around this entire garden too. Okay, so I feel like this little space is like our space. It's neither mine nor hers alone. Uh, both of us, we tend to it together with the help of nature. And like the dragonflies and the bees and the chameleon and uh, the birds that come here as well. That's really yeah. beautiful. <laughs> Papa, you turn it around, then I'll turn it around. Then you want to do what? You can turn it around. Okay. You can turn it around. You can turn it around. You can turn it around. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, now let's leads the farming efforts in the garden. But in the kitchen, it's Grandma who calls the shots. So together with Han Jing's Grandma, we made a dish of paka at Becker's using uh, tapioca and tapioca starch and kneaded them into like little nuggets or balls that were mixed with ingredients like mushrooms, black fungus and soya protein. And then we added some of the vegetables from the garden, specifically azistasia, as the final touch. Gosh, I'm actually salivating. <laughs> so, looks so good. Do you like this tea? This is 10 It's okay. It's a strong mushroom flavor. Mm. And Assistatia does taste like mushroom, so it sort of really balances very well. Yeah, I think it like enhances the taste of it. Mm. You know, sometimes you just take some experimenting and playing around with, and you will have a marvelous dish. Mm. <laughs> As a home grower, Han Sing's efforts to advocate for local greens are small, but noble nonetheless. She's given me confidence that if restaurants could incorporate local greens in their menus, 
more people could learn about these forgotten vegetables. Hey Jason. Hello, good morning. I got a present for you. Very nice. I know like the name you guys changed to Bing Ho Gross. Bing Ho Gross, yes. <laughs> I just have to play that name. Yeah. But this to replicate sunlight, so. Correct, exactly. These are called grow lights, so they, they do replicate sunlight. Um, these ones, depending on how long you turn the lights on for, they will be equivalent to different hours of the day in, in the outdoor. I've incorporated a little bit of Vera Evelyn and Hansing into the garden. So for Vera, I've used the technology of grow lights to replace uh, and supplement sunlight for his indoor space. There are three general terms used. So full sun usually refers to about six to eight hours of direct sunlight. Okay. And then uh, semi-shaded means uh, on average four to six hours oh. of light. And then uh, shaded is usually about one to two hours of light oh. or indirect light. What I have designed for you, I've really considered that you're a very busy chef and you don't have a lot of time to manage your plants. Keeping a watering schedule is another barrier for many home growers. To make watering less of a chore for Chef Jason, I've included a self-watering system in this planter. Below this planter, where I'm, we're going to put all the plants, there is another container below, and that holds a lot of water. So after some time, right, the roots will go into that reservoir, and you'll drink from that reservoir. So how long do I need to refill on that? Maybe once a week or so. Yeah. Uh, so that's the idea. Really, really very little yeah, yeah. Uh, maintenance. Everything? Yeah, everything. We're going to pour until full. We're going to pour it until it's almost full. Because the, the pots actually do have some uh, soil already, so oh. we'll just leave a bit of space for them. Drawing inspiration from my time with Evelyn, I'm balancing all that technology with natural farming techniques. But does it actually got worm is good, right? Yeah, worms are a good sign that there's a lot so of organic really life. Mm. And so all the plants that I brought for you, right, most of them I have chosen because you actually like them from the previous mm. tasting. So I, I brought quite a lot of existation for you. Like this is the butterfly sorrel. Yes. Uh, I know you really like it, so we're going to put three pots here. Can we eat the flowers? Though? You can definitely eat the flowers. The flowers are really, really yummy. It's the ulam raja, your favourite mm -hmm. ones. So these plants will actually get quite big. So I think we can put them here. Does it take up a lot of space after it grows up? Yes, it will. And I just put two together. I'll just put one, one, one there. Usually when you're harvesting, you harvest like early in the morning, sleeping. 6, 7 uh, a.m. So like maybe when your grow lights start turning on, okay. that's when you consider your sunrise. Okay, yeah. got it. Cranberry hibiscus. What well, is huge. Yeah, so I think this can be in the centre. It will give you that very nice height. Yeah. And people walk through, they see, wow, this is a very, very colourful looking planter. Okay, the last one we're going to do is the butterfly blue pea. So that's what the string is here for. They're climbing plants, so they really like to latch onto something. It created quite a very wild and lush look that reminded me of Ethan's food forest. For myself and my gardening method, I like to use these plants that grow like crazy. Yeah. Because there's no maintenance, doesn't need much work. Exactly. You let the plants do the work for you, then you just need to do the harvesting. There's a mini food forest in, in the garden because uh, I've built about two or three different layers. I've had the shrubs in the form of the cranberry hibiscus. I also have the climbing plants in the form of the butterfly blue pea. And on the ground cover, I have plants like uh, purslane, ulam raja. So that's, that's three different layers in this food forest. So it does create uh, a visual impact. It's very three-dimensional if you look at it. So what do you think? Really, really beautiful. With this aesthetic of blue peas, flower, yeah, the hibiscus really feel very garden. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's really amazing at the colour. I was also thinking of your, your business. So people who don't intend to come to the shop, when they walk past, they'll see this colourful thing. Yeah. People might even just come in just to see the garden. I think this one really solved my issue of having my own garden. Mm. Yeah. I think that's why I'm trying to, to show people that smart design will actually be able to solve a lot of problems. After it's all been set up, the garden looks very, very beautiful. Yeah, I think it's definitely a very workable idea to bring in this food forest concept and growing native edible plants in homes. Amazing, thank you. No problem. Looking back at how I first got into urban farming eight years ago, no one even knew what it meant. You know, it wasn't even a, a thing. So there has always been the interest to encourage people to grow food at home and grow local native edibles. And throughout this journey, we've met many people who, from different parts of this 
journey from people who grow food like Evelyn. In fact, from this side, it looks like the whole pharmacy is inside here. It is, it is. <laughs> to people who support the growing of food and, and the systems like Vera. So I've created this place with shade nets and cooling down the area. To the people who actually use the food and create amazing dishes with them like Han Ching's grandma and Chef Jason. It's like an East Meat West dish. Having all the different parts of this food system it's almost like the ecosystem in, in nature. There is also an ecosystem of people appreciating growing local edible plants. And knowing that that exists, it's very, very encouraging. To me, it feels like this journey has been complete. Next week, I enter unknown territories. We're going to actually put um, amaranth um, coming out of this, so it looks like a fountain. Wow. Even though I have been an urban farmer, growing a lot of edible plants, I know absolutely nothing about ornamental plants. For the fur, actually, I combed it with a paintbrush to make it look like uh, someone's hair. Yeah. If plants are not grown for food, is there any value in growing them at all? I feel like <laughs> petting them, you know, like... Yeah. You do that? Yeah, yeah, sometimes I do.